Thanks for joining the Focus Hunting Podcast for us. Hunting in the outdoors isn't just a hobby, it's a lifestyle. Join us as we cover all things hunting, fishing, and the outdoors in Western Canada. Just a little guy. <laughs> I had to reinstall the whole app. It wouldn't let me update, so I just deleted it and reinstalled. So, but, you know. But yeah, just an old dude trying not to go down without a fight. Not a boy. What do you guys got going on, man? Same old buddy. I haven't talked to you in a while. Keep meaning to yeah. get you back on, but um Well, we're here now. It. Yeah. Life gets it's, lifey. Yeah, dude. Okay. There's and there's a lot of there's a lot of shit happening in the uh in the whole industry right now. So it's been kind of fun just sitting back watching the fuckery. Well, I've been listening to your shows and just yeah, on all the freaking drama and stuff it's just oh like, dude holy I, shit man <laughs> i i have i mean look you guys know enough to know that you know I, I say a lot of shit most folks won't but there is so much shit that i can't that i'm not even gonna say right now i mean like i probably have 500 messages on uh people wanting me to make a podcast talking about what happened in vegas with the paywall um and then of course the absolute utter clusterfuck of the live feed i don't know if you guys were watching vegas or not but um they put it behind they put the shoot off behind a paywall and then uh the, the live feed ended before the terminated an hour and 55 minutes uh before the shoot off was over um and the new location for vegas and it's just uh yeah, there's a whole lot of shit happening right now, you know, especially on the industry side with companies and what's happening and archers just don't seem to, you know, archers just don't seem to comprehend the fact that the shit they see happening in the real world with other companies happens in archery as well. Like archery is some mutually exclusive, you know, secret club where everybody involved in archery is a great human and every company is upright and you know forthright and ethical and and i i mean and i'm not over you know i'm not one to judge you know but you know i see like for arrows i see all these arrow brands launching people like oh these are the best arrows ever fucking, and i get paid <laughs> yeah, you fucking idiots they're made in the they're made in the exact same fucking yeah. factory as everything else by in china yeah. the guy that runs its name's frank that's not his real name. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just like, you, you know, and look, I understand that, you know, especially in our space, man, give someone something for free and they will ignore every fact about everything and they'll be a fanboy until someone else gives them 25 cents and a happy meal more. And then they'll fucking jump ship. But anyway, so now, man, it's been, it's been interesting just kind of laying back watching what's happening. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of, I don't know what necessarily you guys want to chat about today, but I kind of started participating. So I didn't know you guys know who this hunt quiet dude is. It's Steven Ranella's brother. Hunt quiet. No. I'm quiet. I haven't heard yeah, I've heard but... a little bit about him, but yeah. So, so if you watched the Joe Rogan podcast with Cam Haynes, they were talking about an in, about a, talking about a guy on the internet, but they wouldn't say his name. Well, it's Steve Ranella's brother. Okay, and he's one of these, you know, um, anti influencer, anti, you know, don't you can't yeah. post you can't post pictures with your dead animal. That's clout chase there. That's clout chasing. Well. Not for everybody, it's not. Yeah. And yeah. and here's, you know, so I've started getting into it with some of those people because they're all pissed off that Joe Rogan, you know, on his podcast said that, you know, if if you get to the trailhead and there's a bunch of people there, go and you, Joe Rogan said, quote unquote, go find another trailhead dummy. And so people are all trying to slam Rogan now because, you know, he has no right to da da da. He doesn't even, you know, there's a lot of shit you don't do either that you have a opinion on. So, yeah. so, you know, what's the problem? And so I, I've started talking to a lot of you know, interacting, I should say with a lot of those people about, um, so you have apps that literally tell you everywhere to go, every tag to put in for 
all the wind direction, all the bear, all the shit you can do. There's podcasts and influencers and straight up services you can pay that tell you what to do and when to do it. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah that's not demonized. Yeah, that's okay. But Joe fucking Rogan, who speaks to, I don't know, a g billion people a day, and just his participation is good for the sport, literally says the quiet part out loud of, I, you know, and I hammered some dude the other day, and I'm like, oh, I am so sorry your honey hole isn't a honey hole anymore, and you might actually have to work harder to get the animals that you used to be able to go out and get after work. Oh, it's 2024, bro. Yeah. Like that, that, and that, and just like those same guys won't do anything for hunting. Those same guys won't contribute anything to the conservation of anything. Like, okay, if we don't get more people hunting, we're fucked. Like, right. it's going to stop. It's going to go pay to play. You're going to have everybody that you, you're only going to be able to hunt on private. We're having the same thing here in Alberta. Like we're one government away, like a liberal government from like screwing us over majorly, turning everything into a park. And people just don't understand that. Like if you don't get people like where were those people when we had um, one of our main areas turned into a park? Where the fuck were those guys? They didn't do jack shit. They, they don't say anything They're like, oh, now there's people in here. Well, right. yeah, there's now there's no one hunting in here. Right. Exactly. It's well, crazy. Well, it's like I told this dude th this week. I said, so you're so upset about your hunting area that for three generations, me and my family, uh, yeah, well, tough shit. Yeah, there's probably apartments now in a whole bunch of places where generations used to hunt. Yeah, You're not, you're not special. That's the problem is everybody thinks they're special and they're not. And so I said, you're sitting here lamenting on the internet because the internet gave you a voice. And you don't know how to use it, but you're sitting here talking about how powd how packed it is and how crowded it is and how hunting's going to be ruined because there's so many fucking people. But yet in America, hunting license sales continue to decrease. Yeah. Yeah. So read the room. Read the room. Yes. Leasing has become an issue in some of these states. Yeah, sure. But guess what? Just because I don't drive a freaking hundred and twenty thousand dollar truck doesn't That's mean so when hilarious. I'm, yeah, d doesn't mean when I'm driving down the road in my fifty thousand dollar truck, when I see that guy in the truck that's worth three times as much, I go fuck you, you're a dick, because you can afford to do something I can't. And like I said the other day to this guy, I'm like, look, I know people personally that kill hundred and eighty plus inch whitetails on public land. In all of these states, you're saying it's not possible. I know people. And, and look, if, if Joe Rogan and Cam Haynes called me, and actually Cam's the one that texted me because I posted something, and I'm like, who the fuck is this Hunt Quiet? I didn't even know who he was. And Cam texted me. He's, he's like, oh, that's Ranella's brother. I was like, oh, copy that. But but my whole thing is it just does. it just amazes me how these people can be so – narrow-minded when it comes to the bigger picture of what's happening and i mean there's four of us on here raise your hand if cameron haynes and joe rogan called you and said hey we have an extra tag for san carlos we'll pay for it but you can come hunt elk who's going S sign me up we're, <laughs> yeah. we're all going yeah we're all going, <laughs> we're all going. Not, I, i'd be left at the border though they wouldn't let me cross that's the only <laughs> thing. right literally I and I just follow Kevin down there. If there was one short of a tag, like, I'll take your tag. Kevin, I'll Literally. Let you know how it goes. <laughs> right. Like I wanted to hunt moose, like not just that moose is legal. I wanted the dinosaur, yeah. like, holy shit. So I called Lee Likoski and I'm like, Hey, so he gave me his guy's name and they dude, it's 65 or better. It's ridiculous. Wow. That is way above my pay grade. I can't, I, I can't afford to do that. I don't hate on Lee for doing it. I don't hate on the guide for his fees and stuff. It's that's what they do, <clears throat> but I can't afford it. So that, but that doesn't mean that I go out and, and hate on it. It just means that, well, like the $150,000 truck, like the, 
all of these other things, just because I can't afford it doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah, it's actually, it's so funny you say that because I literally was just talking about this with my dad where they're like, you know, guys driving $125,000 diesel and then they're bitching about hunt opportunities. It's like, you can go out and pay an outfitter five grand and shoot a dandy uh, mule deer here in Alberta. Right. But you want to drive that, you're sitting there driving that or you're shooting a shitty bow or shitty setup, wasting your time driving around aimlessly, bitching about how you missed all these opportunities. When just if you actually like stop and like look at, okay, I could go on a guided hunt every year and I'm driving still a really nice truck. Right. But it's just, it's just crazy. People don't see that. They don't take a step back and look at that. They think, oh, it's all fucked up. We got this shitty opportunities. The draws are shit. It's like, yeah, but if you really wanted to hunt good animals, you could save five grand right. every year. No problem. Like, right. I just find another trailhead. Yeah, yeah. you find it. Exactly. I just <laughs> well, and whatever. And, I'll get to where you guys can't get to. Then, if we want to play this game, I don't care. Exactly. Well, it's not where they can; it's where they won't. Yeah, I mean, like, look, I'm friends with all these guys, and you know, I've told Aaron Snyder and several guys, like, nope, don't need to go hunting with you, Aaron. You're way hard. You're way above my pay grade and skill set. Um, you know, maybe not shooting, but and the actual hunting's number one, I'm not going to stock at six, seven, two eighty five. First of all, I'm just too big. And number two, I'm not good enough to stock up and shoot a fucking Wolverine at 10 yards with a recurve. I'm not shooting. I'm not sneaking up 10 yards within Wolverines period, let yeah. alone to kill one like Aaron does. So, so I at least know my role, but the thing that kills me is how many people here you know, and it's, it's kind of good. And it's kind of bad. Like they want to normalize, like, let's look at archery, take every single star or celebrity or influencer that there is in our entire space. And here's my unit of measure. How many of them can fly commercial without it being a total clusterfuck? All of them, except two. I don't care if it's Jim Shockey, Cam Haynes, they Levi Morgan, it don't matter. They can all fly commercial and it's no problem. Most people probably won't even really know who they are. Cam, yeah, some. Ted Nugent, Joe Rogan. Those two guys can't walk through an airport. Not a normal one. Mm -hmm. And not not like you and me. Why? Because people will fucking just they'll just bombard them. It, it will be a distraction. So in our space, you think about all the people we have in the hunting industry, public ones. I'm not talking about Donald Trump Jr. And the guy that owns Jimmy John's that goes without saying, but your public influencer type people in our space, we have two bow hunters that can't go to airports. We're not famous. None of us are famous. Those two guys famous, nobody else famous. So when you start thinking about that, it's like, well, how much time, you know, using Joe Rogan as an example, and I've never met the guy, we're not friends, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to imply that, but how much time does Joe Rogan have to go out and scout? Yeah. How, mu how much time does Joe Rogan have to do all of this other stuff that normal folks like us do? You, you realize how busy that guy is? When he, when he goes, I saw a stat, <clears throat> when he goes and makes an appearance on another podcast it cost him 50 grand just because of his time his time he travels with a security team you need to understand that like x seals like yeah he travels with a security team because people are fucking idiots and it's not like they're gonna walk up to joe and be like hey joe i hate you i want to fight and then he can just whoop your ass he has legitimate security concerns. So he's got to travel with security and he's got to do this and he's got to do that. He can't just Joe Rogan can't just, you know, like if the four of us were together, we're like, Hey, we just did the podcast. Let's go eat. There's a great Mexican spot down the road. Yeah. Well, if Joe Rogan was one of us four, we couldn't do that. It's just, it's a huge, and that's what people don't take into consideration is not everybody has the time to do what we do. So, I, I was a roofer way back in the day. Well, I got my roof done a couple years ago. Do you think I did it? No, no, I didn't. 
Why? Because I don't have the time or the inclination and I'm old. So I paid somebody to do it. Well, guess what? Joe Rogan has the capacity to pay someone to do things to save because his time is worth more than the effort it would take to research menial stuff. So Joe Rogan has the capacity to go hunt cool places and to go hunt, you know, stuff. And it blows me away, especially right now. And and once again, it's the internet's fault. And I know we're talking on the internet right now, so we're hypocrites. And, yeah. you know, we talk about, oh, made America and America first. I'm all about that. I still got a fucking iPhone. You know, <laughs> I still, I still have shoes that aren't made here. You think these headphones and this microphone are made? No, it, I'm not. I'm on a lap. I'm on a MacBook Pro. I'm a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. None of us have the capacity. If you have a computer, um, none of us can truly say, "Oh yeah, I'm up. Made in America only." Sorry, no, awesome. no, it's not. No, it's not. And so, you know, what I'm seeing right now is a whole bunch of people want to be selectively outraged, and when it affects them. Exactly. That's or a really when it, good way to put that. I like that. Yeah. Or when it triggers them. Yeah. That's kind of what it boils down to. And that's what I told this dude the other day. I said, this just looks like um, outdoor. I, how did I word it? Either outdoor or conservative wokeism. Oh, I know. I said reverse wokeism. I said, we're just not trying to, because this person with, there's a bunch of people that are like, you're going to boycott Joe Rogan and boycott everything that he represents. And that, and I'm like, are you fucking crazy? Yeah. I mean, I talk to a lot of dealers and Cam Haynes, Levi Morgan, it don't matter. Guess what dealers' names are hearing people say out of their mouths when they're walking into the door more than any? Joe Rogan. Yeah. Now, are 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 they walking in and saying, I want the Hoyt Ventum, blah, 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 blah. And I want the site, I want this site and I want this release because Joe Rogan's shooting it. No. That's not what Joe Rogan's role is. Joe Rogan's role is people walking in the door going, hey, I saw Joe Rogan shoots a bow, and I saw Joe Rogan talking about this, and Joe Rogan talking about that. I want to get into archery. That's his role. His role is, not to, his role is not to push product. His role is to push the activity. Yeah, that's good. And, that's better. Yeah, and way better. We ourselves, I mean – and we have to lump ourselves into this because it's a communal thing. We consume our own. And the fact that we're willing to turn on Joe Rogan because he says some by maybe by our standards, maybe he says some newbie shit. He's a fucking newbie. What do you expect? Yeah. And his perspective on things is not the same. It's like when you've heard all these rich people, when they talk about Lamborghinis and Bugattis and some clown in the comments will be like, what does it get for fuel economy? And the guy will be like, if you can afford the car, you don't give a shit what kind of fuel economy it gets. But everybody nowadays wants to normalize and make themselves feel special and make themselves feel like we're all equal and we're not. I'm not equal to Joe Rogan and Cam Haynes and all these guys and some of the other stuff, you know, it's like, you know, I know it doesn't show, but I lift a lot of weights. And so, you know, being a scrawny little pussy, like, right. A squat scrawny little, you know, like, I don't post a lot of uh, workout stuff. Most half the questions I get are about working out, but like I'll video myself throwing up some one twenties or whatever on dumbbells or, you know, repping out, 220 or 310 on the incline bench. And I will, and I don't use a spotter because I don't, for me, I don't lift heavy enough weights for me to feel like I need a spotter right 310 now. 310 is pretty fucking heavy. For, for some people, mm -hmm. paying to go hunt in San Carlos is expensive as fuck. Mm -hmm. To some for people. Some people. Yeah. <laughs> Not heavy for me. And so I, and, Every single time I post it, I get a whole bunch of PM. That's not safe. You need this and you need that. And I'm like, oh, no, God. fucker, you do. Yeah. Those are the bullshit. guys that need to get off the internet. Yes. Every, yeah. Everyone, everyone gets that all the time. You, you, you train so too much. Off. You do. You run too much. You train too much. Fuck off. How do you don't know worry what about do? what I do? Yeah. You just go make yourself happy. And do one thing I don't fuck. understand about those people bitching about people in trailheads is like, if you put 10, 10 guys, the best hunter is going to come up with the elk every single time. 
<laughs> right. And then the guy, the guy who became the best hunter put more time in the woods than, than you did. And that's fact. just a fact. Like if I yep. see a bunch of people that trail and I want to go in there, I'm going to go in there. Right. Oh I yeah. Don't care. I don't care who's in there. And you'll get, I also know that I'm a better elk hunter than the rest of those guys in there. And I've also put thousands of days and hundreds of thousands of man hours in the bush. So yep. it just like, just get better. Like don't bitch about who's in there. Or I'm going to assume they're all newbies. That's how right. I look at it. Well, Unless and, I know who it is and it's a buddy and being like, oh, I'm going to stay out because I know my buddy's actually after a specific right. animal. That's the only reason I'm not going in there. Besides that phone call, dude, come help me pack out. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and the thing that I hear from more and more friends of mine who are experienced in doing that kind of stuff, and you know, for the most part, this is usually an elk mule deer thing. This is a left coast lefty kind of thing because whitetail it's not necessarily the same but kind of but with mule and white tear with mule mule deer and, and elk i should say i'm hearing more and more and i've heard this forever just i hear it more and more now is guys who are experienced when they realize there's multiple people in a certain area or a certain draw they will position themselves for the other people to fuck it up fucking right yeah you can use that to your like, advantage. Oh yeah, that like that is legit what I did with my kid. I knew where <laughs> all the pressure was coming. I'm like, yeah, they're gonna push all the elk right to us, and sure as shit, right at right at uh, shooting like there's 200 head. Yep, it's it's crazy. Like, and you need those new guys to be there, experience it, even if they're not successful. Like even during COVID, it was like, you know, it's a little discouraging to a degree, but they're not going in crazy deep. But at least they get the whole experience. Yep. Usually it's too hard for them and they quit. You need those guys because then when they go and they vote or they talk about hunting, it's nothing but positive. And, and they're spreading that good word for us because if you don't have those people, none of this is going to go on. They're, like that ballot voting shit is going to kill us. Right. And how else are people supposed to learn? Exactly. Yeah, you got to get somewhere. after it. You right. got to get and, after it. And once again, unless you're Joe Rogan and I've, heard stories early on joe fucked up plenty of hunts he fucked up the kind of hunts that all four of us would be throwing up relentlessly and <laughs> want to kill ourselves for the amount of money invested into that hunt luckily for joe doesn't bother joe but joe had to learn a lot of lessons the hard way yeah. just like cam did i mean dude look i'm an oregon boy so i remember cam haynes in you know 99 2000 when he was not what he is now, and he was wearing the acid-washed denim jeans, the acid-washed denim jacket, the acid-washed acid denim fanny pack. I'm talking like 2000, son. And Cam was just a regular Oregon dude, just a guy. And he still is that guy. Now, yes, he has a million-plus followers, and everybody thinks he's something. But I can tell you right now, uh, Cam Haynes is the exact same as far as I'm concerned now as he was 25 years ago. He just doesn't sport all the acid washed clothing, luckily. Um, you should bring Pete that still, back. Pete still has that all that stuff. He wears You're it. just fucking jealous, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so and so everybody has to learn and everybody has learned. It's just a matter of Joe Rogan and some of these people, their lessons are one, more expensive for them. Uh, and number two, a lot of times more public. I mean, how many times have the four of us been in the woods and completely stepped on our dick? Well, there's no one there to see it. So the only people that know are the people we tell. Yeah. And, and if, you know, if we tell hunting fuck up stories today, X number of people are going to hear those stories and laugh at us and hopefully learn with us and understand, Oh, I've done that. Well, with Joe Rogan and a lot of these other people, Theirs is way more public. So for Joe Rogan to tell a hunting fuck up story, 50 million people probably hear it. Mm -hmm. So it's a big difference. And then they're going to be like, oh, that fucking newbie idiot. Whereas if we <laughs> say it, you know, if we say it, they're like five people hear it. Yeah. You know, well, I don't know about five, <laughs> but, but, but Hopefully literally, they're, five. <laughs> yeah, right. But they're just like, oh, those are just regular guys like us. But I promise you, if, if, no one real, you know, obviously we're all normal people, but if no one realized and the four of us were on $25,000 elk hunts and we were talking about fucking up elk hunts 
and then we said how much it cost us, those people wouldn't be favorable to us at all because it immediately makes them feel inferior and it makes them feel like we're doing something that they can't do. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Yes, we are. Well, we are not, but in, te- in, te- you know, technically, you know, it's like shooting distance. Are we recording yet? Or do we need to do an intro or are we going to start? No, over? no. no oh, we're recording, is... dude. Oh, yeah, we don't, we, you've already been on the show. So fucking highball. All right, here we go. So, <laughs> so, right. And so it's like shooting. It's like shooting distance. When I see people say, Oh, no, any archery shot over 30 yards is unethical. Well, if, you, if you think shooting anything over 30 yards is unethical, please don't shoot over 20. Yeah. Cause you I, suck. Yeah. and you know, once again, it goes back to everything else. I, if the, if the situation is right, and that's the thing that everyone, well, the animal could move. Well, yeah, it could. And that's why if you're taking a 70, 80, 90, 100 yard shot, the situation has to be right. I mean, it ha- the situation has to be right or you are unethical. Now, <clears throat> with that being said, and, and I post this sometimes on the internet because I'm not afraid to say it. I can't remember the name. <clears throat> But a lot of your old school uh, bow companies named after him and other people back in the 40s, 50s and 60s, they use poison on their on their broadheads. And a lot of people don't know that. So when you see and it doesn't make them less of a hero, it's what they did in the times. But poisoned tip arrows were extremely highly used way back in the day. And the reason for that is back then you could fling a with a with a recurve or whatever bow you wanted to use, you could fling at something 100 yards on the move because if you hit it in the big toe, its diaphragm's going to stop working because it's poisoned and it's going to go lay down and suffocate and die. But people don't want to hear that now. They want to go, "Oh, they were so much more ethical back then." Well, if we're going to measure by today's standards what do you think would happen if joe bag of donuts bow hunter got caught in 2024 using poison tipped broadheads bro would lose his he, if oh, dude was the manager him. yeah if he was the manager of a grocery store he'd lose his job because the the woke hunting mob would come for him but 60 years ago no one gave a shit and today, no one seems to give a shit that they used openly used poison on their arrows because all you had to do was draw blood. Poison gets in the thing. It shuts down the diaphragm is what it does. So they can't breathe. So they go lay down, suffocate. It's over. Most people don't know that. And when you bring it up, it does not get well received because all of all of our community has this illusion of what hunting actually is. And. You know, I have a meme on my video I saved on my phone that I've yet to drop. And it's a picture of a whitetail and it's a guy superimposed on it. He's throwing a fit and it says whitetail hunters when they realized that someone shot a big deer over a planted bait pile rather than a dumped bait pile. (laughs) And I'm over here like, <laughs> oh, so if you planted a bait pile. So much better. It's, it's so much more ethical <laughs> than if you just drove yeah. your truck out there and dumped a bunch of it. So if you plant it and it grows, totally ethical. If you drive out there and just dump it, unethical. And it's like, wait, what? Or county by county, state by state. It's like, well, it's it's legal right here, but if I walk 50 feet that way, it's not legal. What the fuck? And that's part of the problem is we have so many rules and laws that are just antiquated beyond belief. Here's another one. <clears throat> and there are some states trying to work on this right now. And this is a highly controversial one. Um, if you're running trail cameras that send pictures immediately to your phone, how is that any different than baiting? Mm-hmm. Now, now you know where to hunt. Yeah. And like, we're a lot, and we have all those different rules too. Like 
certain there's times a border year. line right where there's a line where you're allowed to bait white yeah. t- like you're allowed to bait deer and then you get to a line and you're not allowed to bait deer right and then you then you're allowed to use trail cameras between these dates but then after those dates like it's just like use them or don't like so if right because you're still allowed to use them during the hunting season you can use sell cam ones or sell no sell sell cams you can't you you can't not yes, well, can. guess region four you can't once again here's your so line in the center. this is the funny thing <laughs> this is what i'm saying this is the funny thing about okay so like in region eight here you can use trail cameras up to december 5th or it can't use trail cameras from up to it starts at a certain date i don't remember the starting date but i remember it ends december 15th but the season's open till december 20th so like if you're allowed to use them for the last five fucking days why would it make a difference if you're allowed to like what difference does it make at that point yeah Right. And so legally is one thing. And I I mean, I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. If you step foot in the woods to hunt often enough, you have violated a game law and you probably didn't even know it because there's so many of them. You can't keep track. It's, it's not possible. Well, and they changed constantly too. And it's like, unless you're going on, like, unless you go on the website every 15 minutes or not, not every 15 minutes, but like, if you, unless you're constantly going on the really? webpage to look, right. You don't know. And well, it's and- not just, yeah, it's not just like hunting laws. It's just like, there's a lot of other laws that hunting falls, that hunting falls into as well. Exactly. And I mean, I have, I have friends that have literally seen a, seen an amendment or an amendment or an addendum or whatever you want to call it. And who do you call to ask? You call fish and game or whatever it's called in your country, state, whatever, whatever, fish yeah. and game, whatever. You call fish and game because they're the enforcement arm. And a lot of times they don't even know. That hasn't even made it to them yet. Exactly. Well, they, they, they're they uh, like a lot of the time it's just like, well, look in your synopsis. Okay. Right. It's not in there. Yeah. How How is it actually implemented in the real world? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that is, that is the point. So we're all violating laws of some particular kind. So I, uh, you know how sometimes something will imprint on you, whether you want it to or not, and you just never forget it. So when I was, God, I don't even, or my early twenties and I wasn't necessarily into hunting yet, but I would go hang out with guys that did and blah, blah, blah. Who here knows what a riparian zone is? Exactly. So I believe a, it's down in a wetland kind of lower area where it's uh it, it's a different yeah it's a different habitat more for yeah so kind of that so, transition between the water so basically and the land. it nor damn yeah pretty much but basically so I was hunting with a guy and there was this little creek and the water was down a bit and so it it was exposing not you know, like little islands, it was exposing little islands out in the middle of the river and there was vegetation there. Well, if you, and it was literally a foot and a half deep. And so, you you know, we're walking across it and this buddy of mine stops on this little island and is standing on it. A, a, A fish and game guy saw, saw him and tried to give him a citation for violating and destroying a riparian zone because it's the transition from this little island to the different, different, like a body of water. And we're like, and there was no Google back then because this was, you know, way long time ago in the early nineties. And we're just like, so to this day, I have literally never forgot the word riparian zone because I was like, what the, who the, who the hell would know one you can't you can't walk on it number two who's going to know how to even define it and it goes that same way today and that's why i bring up the whole baiting thing because it's like one out here on the west coast baiting what are we talking about baiting is alan iverson here we're talking about practice no baiting no one out it's not a really a thing out here unless you like hunt off an alfalfa field that's baiting but it's whether they designated as baiting, but I'm not even talking about the legal side of it. I'm talking about our hunting community's propensity to absolutely consume our young and burn anyone to the ground before one, 
before they have due process because you know everybody's about due process when it comes to I don't want to get political, but everybody's about due process when it comes to politicians and when it comes to sports stars and everyone's about due process when it comes to all of this. But when it comes to hunters, oh, no, that fish and game official was 100 percent right, 100 percent legitimate. And this person is guilty before being, you know, before anything simply because they got charged with it means they're guilty. So as an outdoor industry, as outdoor people you know, not us four, of course, but as a whole, we apply a judgment to people before they've had a chance to defend themselves based upon what a fish and game official or someone else uh, deems appropriate. And so that's where the whole baiting thing comes into it. Trail cameras are the, you know, that's my whole point is, well, isn't a trail camera like basically digitally, digitally baiting? I'm not against it. I'm not judging anyone yeah. that uses it. I, I, I am a hundred percent indifferent to it. I don't care. But my question is, what's the difference between baiting with corn or whatever the hell they use, uh, or digitally? Because you're basically doing the same thing. Yeah, I, there's a lot of like it's there's a lot of complexity in all of it. And I mean, even like we're. Derek hunts he hunts in Alberta and like what's the rules there on hunting in like cornfields and stuff you're fine yeah there's no issue as long as you're you haven't dr specifically dropped down grain but it's all agriculture well you could just plant there's... a 3,000 acre cornfield yeah and you'll see that like in certain areas where like landowners they for whatever reason didn't uh didn't harvest silage and there'll be deer in there you can oh, still yeah. hunt you That's what I mean. So, like, areas, when they yeah. they they leave a good section out, and then they got a big. Yeah, like whether or not it was left specifically out for deer hunting or not, that's kind of besides <laughs> the point, right? Yeah, that's it's a that's still, a personal. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah still and it's a, it, it's still crazy. A giant corn pile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and then I mean. and then it's... you could just expand this out. Like, where do you draw the line? Like, we're getting pretty technologically advanced with our optics, our range finders, our bows, our sights. You know, like that's where it's a slippery slope. Like when you talk about, well, this is ethical, this isn't ethical. Well, I'm pretty sure we're using state of the art carbon fiber bows and range finders that can range 7,000 yards. Like you gotta be careful with how you approach this topic, right? Like shit well, talking end, one guy. Yeah. That's what you're like, like to Greg's point. Yeah. To yeah. Greg's point, it's like, you, it's a slippery slope and like you start harping on people for everything. And then eventually some you know it's going to be you whether you, whether you did it intentionally or not like it's just yeah and it depends on the, the hunting corn. opportunities of of that region too like for us like for me personally like trail cams to a degree in some areas it's pretty effective but for others it's not effective at all so it's kind of left up to the area and the person how they want to hunt right if you can only hunt a certain small amount of area you're going to have trail cams like because that's where you can hunt so you need to know everything that's going on if you're doing big uh, expansive areas and in, in in public and crown land you probably you might have some honey holes but you're not going to be super reliant on that so each to their own right i'm not going to shit on someone for how they're forced to hunt to try and be successful and to actually be ethical or selectively kill a certain level of animal like each into their own right yeah i mean and, and so for so I, I won't say who but there is a very very high profile um, name that um, back in the day were the top of the food chain. They've, they're way older now, but this is way, way back. And so, as you know, NASA has the ability, you know, we've all seen the thing, oh, NASA can zoom in on a license plate on a car in the middle of New York, and you can read it with their satellite and all that kind of stuff. Well, you can pay not all of it, but you can pay to access that satellite imagery. <laughs> really? Oh, yes. And way back in the day, it was about $25,000. And so before cell phone trail cameras, before any of this stuff, when the trail cameras sucked, there was, this happened. And these gentlemen would monitor their big deer 
and track their deer because they were making mad money at the time. They own thousands and thousands of acres, but they were tapped into that NASA network and they could monitor their big deer in real time before That's crazy. It was, before, there were no iPhones. This is how long ago this was. And the, the, the reason that this came to light was because there was public access because we all know that there's public access on a lot of things. And a guy was riding his bike, not even hunting, like riding his bicycle, you know, like the Karen in the beginning of wizard of Oz, he was just boo, boo, doo, riding his bike. And all of a sudden a truck pulled up and stopped him and said, Hey, you can't drive down this road. And he goes, yeah, I can. And was told by one of these gentlemen's that no, 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 there's, about 400, 500 yards down here, there's a several heap of our sh big bucks that are bedded right off the road. And if you drive your bike down here, you'll, you'll, you'll spook them off. So you can't, can't drive down here. And he was like, how the fuck do you know that? And how did you know I was here? And he told him, oh, we saw you. What? And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, man. Um, I think within reason, yeah. anything, you know, anything that you can do to increase your chances of harvesting an animal are for the most part, I don't really care as long as you're not trapping it, as long as you're not restraining it, as long as you're not yeah. you know, high fence, go suck one. I have no respect for high fence stuff. <clears throat> um, unless it's intentional. Like not the big white tails and shit, but if you have a, you know, five, 10,000 acres or whatever in Texas and you want to put some exotics on there, I don't give a shit. But for the most part, most yeah, of five to 10,000 acres, though, that's like, fuck, man, that's almost wild at that point. It gets yeah, to a certain huge. point. When exactly. It's, like, it's huge. But, yeah. but we all know when that feeder goes off and the animals hear it, it's the Pavlonian response and they come running. So five, 10,000 acres becomes real fucking small when you got 20 feeders out there that you can work off of because mm -hmm. it's like a dinner bell or in that case, it's a death bell. But so I don't necessarily have a problem with anyone, you know, using trail cameras, you know, do I, does it appeal to me as a left coast guy when I see a giant white tail just mowing down on a five foot wide it foot thick pile of corn and some dude blasts it bow or gun don't care and blood comes out of its mouth on you can see it on the corn and it's like <sighs> no that doesn't appeal to me it doesn't appeal to me if someone shoots a buck while he's mounting a doe like dude let dude get his nut and then <laughs> deal with it after that it wouldn't it wouldn't appeal to me <laughs> to kill somebody while they're at the dinner table or at the buffet, it's like, come on, man. Um, but at the same time, my problem with it is continuity. We don't have any, we have no continuity because so much of this is new. I mean, the amount of baiting and the fact that they were using poison tipped arrows 50, 60 years ago, you know, 50 years, isn't that long. It's really not. I'm sorry. It's not that long. It's a lifetime for Pete. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> not for you though. Not for you though. <laughs> right. Some and so I, yeah. How old yeah. are you, Greg? I, I am yeah. I'll be 54 in uh next month. Oh yeah. So you're not much older than Pete. Yeah. So Derek, there, he's, he's still me. he's just grown facial hair, Derek. He's, he's <laughs> oh, yeah. right. And so so yeah. for me, it you know, it, it it's not necessarily the moral or eth ethical dilemma of using trail cameras, of um using bait, you know, because Hunters have a real easy time differentiating bait versus bait, like we've discussed. Oh, if you plant it, it's not bait. But if you just dump it on the ground, it's bait. Man, shut up. You're full of hooey. And you're only saying that to justify it to yourself because you're probably one of the clowns that does one or the other while trying to burn somebody down for doing one or the other. Yeah, but, I, I think that's it, too, is like, like for me, I don't really care how you hunt as long as it's as long as you're doing it legally then i mean do it however you want but just do it but don't right. bitch on other people for doing it a different way exactly well <clears throat> so i saw a uh i saw a, uh an an interview and i actually saved it on my phone as well 
And this guy was talking, it was baiting in Pennsylvania. And apparently baiting in Pennsylvania is not legal unless it falls under certain kinds of parameters like fucking yes or no. But anyway, so this guy was talking to um, the fish and game guys out there and they told him that it's their estimation 95% of the people that are baiting never get caught until another hunter tells on them because it's so prolific. So many people are baiting in Pennsylvania. They can't catch them all. So the only people that they can catch are the people that other hunters tattletale on. And that really resonated with me. I'm like, so, okay. If you walk back X amount of distance and you put out bait and you know, it's illegal and you never get caught. Did you bait? If a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, did it make a noise is, is the point. And as hunters, I think we have self-justified so much shit that's not legal or ethical, but we justify it to ourselves because oh, it's, it's just me. I'm just doing this. But yeah, well, when there's millions of people doing that, now what? And so, you know, it's like this. And have, have you guys seen this thing about the uh, this this new Olympics that's supposed to be dropping next year? No. <laughs> Performance no. enhancing. Yeah, that's the steroid one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh, seriously? That. I've yes, been asking boy. for that for years. I was like, yeah, we need to have a clean one and let's it. see how jacked up we can get people to go. Let's see how fast somebody can run, like jack <laughs> them up. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> like, you know, people look at like the, uh, Mr. Olympia, like professional bodybuilders and they're like, Oh yeah. Those guys put it. Those guys are walking science experiments and no one cares. Most all of them die young. Arnold Schwarzenegger's had like four open heart surgeries. Cause he was on horse freaking steroids back in the day legitimate horse ones like not even for human consumption and so it's like well that's their body but if that's what they want to do they're they're going to reap the benefits of of sponsorships of fame of they ain't gonna have to wait in restaurants they're gonna i don't give a shit do what you want to do but that's the whole point i and i'm and i'm with you i would love to see what a juice head could run in the hundred yard dash against Hussein Bolt's legitimate, um, no failed drug tests, insert Lance Lance Armstrong here, um, time. Because you and I both know, and, and I'm gonna make this up. This is hyperbole. I don't even know what the world record is for the hundred yard dash. I know it's under 10 seconds, which is stupid. Um, I don't even think my car will do that. But um I would love to see what a what a dude who's completely juiced, because if if some dude who's completely juiced comes out there and runs a sub nine second hundred yard dash and obliterates the world record by a second, why the hell would I want to watch the regular people? That's what I'm talking yeah. about. I'm good at them sitting on the freaking starting line, blood doping right there. Shoot less. that shoot that son of a bitch up with his speed juice and let him go. Like right. I want 100%. to see him fly. Right. And so I'm not saying I, I would do it, but right. yeah. That's right. entertainment. <laughs> but guess what? I wouldn't run a hundred yard dash clean either. I don't care. I'm watching it. I'm not participating in it. And that's, that's run, the period. whole thing. Yeah. All of these millions of people that watch the Super Bowl, they ain't playing football ever. They're just watching it. And so I say all of this to, to get back to, to one point, like, and I have these conversations probably way more than I should. But we talk about morals and ethics and we talk about baiting and we talk about, you know, planting food plots versus baiting and trail cameras versus baiting. And we talk about trailheads and find another one dummy and we people trying to fucking burn down Joe Rogan like that's going to happen. If the real woke mob couldn't burn Rogan down, what the fuck do you think some hunters whining like stuck pigs is going to do? Pardon my Francais there. But all of these things we hear about morals and ethics and hunting and we have a history of using poison and we have a history of doing some whack shit hunters famous hunters have been caught killing deer dragging it to another area or killing a deer and freezing it and then dragging it to another area putting it underneath the tree and faking it so hunters have done some whack stuff but in all these conversations 
where Seems we talk like it about would just be easier to go kill a fucking legal deer than do all that well they're doing it they're doing it for 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 dollars on hunting television shows so oh and this was years ago dude dave watson got caught blasting a massive buck off the back porch and the, the family that was there with them told on them so hunters for tv do some crazy sh shit but in general hunters like in pennsylvania so many of them are illegally baiting but what i don't hear people talk about morally and ethically when it comes to all this stuff is i don't care if you hunt over bait i don't care if you plant corn i don't care if you dump corn i don't care if you mix up some freaking freaking deer crack and pour it out there to hunt i don't care i want to see hunters care more about how good they shoot a bow because if you want to talk about the number one ethical and moral issue in archery hunting, in my opinion, it's the fact that these guys can't hit their ass with both hands. And the number of wounded and unretrieved animals is fucking preposterous. And we don't even know a fraction of it because those people don't, don't tell. No. But we do have numbers that tell us it is massive, like massive. <clears throat> to the point of more animals are shot and unrecovered than are shot and recovered. So when you start talking about all of this, I just ask, well, if you think like to, you know, that comment I made, if you're telling me that shooting an animal over 30, 40 yards with a bow is unethical, you had better not be shooting anything over 20. And I know lots of instances where people have shot stuff in the butthole, not a Texas heart shot from the side um, <laughs> at 17 yards. So where's the moral and ethical, where's the moral and ethical quandary really come into play when you suck so bad at shooting that you're out there wounding three animals for every one that you recover? Where's you always, that discussion? You always see those memes out just before hunting season start. Doesn't matter which season where you got your 3D target and there's one arrow in the lungs and the rest are scattered over the entire body. And you're like, yep, dialed in for hunting season. Yeah. You're like yeah, I wonder how true that is for a lot of people. Well, and that's with no that's with no that's with no pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, dude, I'll admit it. I shake like a dog shit in razor blades when I'm trying to kill an animal. Like the whole time, all I'm telling myself is, ah, you're not gonna shoot. You're not gonna shoot. Just draw back and aim. We'll see how it goes. I've let down on animals that were 35, 40 yards away, and my buddies have been like, Are you drunk? Be like, no. But if you would have saw where my pen was going, you wouldn't have shot either because there was dirt. There was blue skies. There was some <laughs> fur. There was a tree. But you I'm know what? Like, At least you got the discipline for that to see that and recognize it. Dude, I have no to. one to let down. Well, and first, you know, I mean, you guys know me well enough to know that if we were hunting together and you whiffed or shot something in the toe, I would relentlessly hound you. Now think about my friends. And the fact that I'm a good shot, I'm a fair shot. If I was to do some shit like that, my friends would never let me hear the end of it. They can make fun of me for letting down when I should, when they don't think I should have, I'm fine with that, but completely shooting something in the butt or missing or shooting it in the toe. I'll never outlive that. It's like, you know, I was an engineer on the railroad for a lot of years when I was younger. And so anytime I come up to railroad tracks, I'm very, very cautious, more cautious than normal. You know why? Because if I, someone who worked for the railroad for 12 years, gets hit by a fucking train, my PMs are going to blow up from a whole bunch of people I worked with. Like, are you <laughs> retarded? So, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things where, you know, that, you know, those are true good friends though. I got to say that. Of course. Absolutely. Those are I the best them. ones to have. And I know, and I know what's coming. So yeah. When I draw back and, and I hunt with a hinge, with a click, because I've shot it so many hundreds of thousands of times, there is a familiarity there, but bro, I will draw back. And in my head, I'm like, just, let's just draw back and aim. You're not going to shoot. You're not going to shoot. Don't even worry about it. Let's just draw back and aim and we'll just see how it's going. Sometimes it's not going good. Other times I'll be like, you know, this is not looking too bad. And then as soon as that release goes click, I'm like, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I know this. And then I can execute a shot and harvest the animal and everything's good. But if I draw back and it looks like there's a 
earthquake happening, the release never clicks. And my mind never goes into that mode of, oh yeah, no, we're good. Now just execute. Doink. We're good. Because sometimes I never get there. But for me, and I can't say rather because we're just way too deep into our system. But I would much rather see um, bow hunters, especially. We can get into the crossbow thing, but I would much rather see bow hunters tested on their ability to actually shoot more than I would give a shit if you're hunting over corn. Because which one of those is the bigger problem? Yeah. Archer's competency is the bigger problem. And so yeah. I, I know like at the archery shop here, there's a lot of guys like middle beginning of August or middle of August, they'll go buy a bow and go bow hunting with it. And they never shot a bow before. Right. Like, you seriously, you're going out in two weeks. Like mm-hmm. yeah. show no me, clue. dude, show me the same anchor twice. <laughs> right. And exactly. It's like, it, yeah, this just never happened. I got a question for you, Greg, yes, sir. You were talking about, when you're shooting on an animal and going through that process that clicked, was that like, did you go through that same thing when you were in at target archery at the beginning? Yeah. So, so first of all, when it comes to the animal side, I used to hunt with a Fletcher, the old Jim, the uh-huh. Fletcher release. Love that thing. I still have it. Now this was good, good God, early two thousands. And I was shooting tournaments with, with a hinge already, but I was hunting with a, with a, pull and punch yeah and i was out hunting out in eastern oregon in the strawberry mountains and we were back in camp and i had whiffed on a deer shot right over the top of it went back to camp and i could execute with my and i could execute with that fletcher amazing but as soon as there was fur on the other end i was done and so at camp <clears throat> excuse me at camp i switched to my um zenith release no click back tension release zenith and did well got a deer didn't get an elk it's a whole nother story i'd be willing to tell you if you want to hear it i had a great opportunity i shot right over its back because i mispinned because i had snuck up anyway it's a great story but it's embarrassing anyway so did that and immediately i never went back and so i was shooting the cascadian range in eugene oregon way back when and I was doing, I was in the lead and I'll never forget the target. It was up on top of the hill and there was a clear cut. They had clear cut the property next to it. I was in the lead first arrow, draw back, doink in the middle, go to draw back the second arrow. He just sent it. I remember watching that. It was a gold tip ultralight 300 with 140 grains, 2.25 flex fletch. Why I remember that. I don't know. Woof. And it goes over the target, over the backstop, and out into the clear cut. Didn't even hear it land. And I was like, what? Finished the day, not shooting well, because now I'm scared to death. I have literally three inches of travel on my release to get it to go off now, because I think it's always going to misfire. Got down to the bottom of the range, took the release apart, flipped the moon around to where I had a click, and I've shot a click ever since. So on, on the hinge, it's just like a safety. Um, but that's pretty much how I got to it. And then once the hunting situation came in, I, you know, it's, uh, it's, that's been history ever since. Yeah. Like when you're on the line shooting at like these big tournaments, though, do you like at the beginning, when you first started doing them, did you get that same panic that you do when you're hunting? Like, you know, that starts to shake and shaky panic No, or not- is it just for hunting? Uh, just hunting. I get a different gotcha. kind of, I get a diff- different kind of nervous for right. target archery. Um, in, in target archery, it's, it's, it's more of a, um, you know, and, and I'll just say this right up front, my entire professional career, I had to compete against Jesse Broadwater, Shane Wills, Chance Bobeff, Real Wild, Dave Cousins, Levi Morgan, Danny McCarthy, like literally the murderers the best. Of, yeah. of the best of the best. So I, I never won a professional tournament, not because, well, because I wasn't as good as those guys. I'm just going to be honest with you. Those guys are at a different level. They're all goat status. They're all, it's ridiculous how good these guys are. And it wasn't that my equipment was worse. It wasn't my tuning was probably as good or better, but those guys have it between the ears 
and I just couldn't put it together at national events. So I just want to put that out there. But the the um, the the tension and the stress that I feel at a shooting tournament event is 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 a little bit different simply because it's not necessarily um, the fear of of missing. It's the fear of winning. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so when you get closer to a chance where you can win, does that anxiety build up? Oh, absolutely. No question. By orders of yeah. magnitude, by orders of magnitude. Yeah. And also there are certain personality types that, that play a role in that. Um, you know, you look at a guy like Jesse Broadwater, who is definitely one of the goats. You can't tell whether he's win winning, losing, whether he missed, whether he hit his shot is like Memorex. It looks like he doesn't have a pulse. There's cold water flowing through his veins. You can't tell anything with him. Conversely, you talk about another goat, Levi Morgan. I've talked with him about this on, on my podcast. I've talked with him about this in interviews. You can literally watch Levi go from a thumb button to a hinge from target to target. You can watch Levi at full draw and you can see his hand shaking literally visibly his hand is shaking still hits the middle so everybody has a different way of processing it there are certain personality types that are better at processing it than others but for me um you know uh, the tournament side yes the more you do it the better but um the the missing in a tournament is different than the pressure that I feel in, in, in hunting, because number one, I'm shooting a piece of paper or a piece of foam. And so it's not a matter of life and death. It's a matter of winning and not winning. And the fear of success is probably what holds more people back than the fear of failure, because we all fail every single day. When I see a line of, when I'm driving into town and I know I got five stoplights to go through, and I come around that corner and I see the first three are green. I'm like, hell yeah. And when the first one turns red in my face, I'm a failure. I lost. Well, that happens every day to all of us. It is just, it just does uh, all kinds of ways it, we fail constantly all day, every day. But when it comes to, to shooting the bow, um, it's different because if I miss a spot in Reading, or if I miss a, a 10 in Vegas, or if I miss an X or, whatever I miss, um, first of all, generally speaking, it's all in my control, but the consequences of missing that is generally just not, not winning. I'm not going to win. Yeah. My, my chance of winning is completely over now for the most part. Whereas with hunting, I, I'm, I'm taking the life of an animal. Yeah. Um, I, I want so the, that the gravity is, is a little more, hundred percent. Yeah, um, not only that, I spent all this money, time and effort. I want to eat that bitch. Yeah. That's food. I, that's food. And so it, you know, it's, it's a whole lot more, you know, my wife, Kathy and I, we prefer to eat pretty much as much wild game as possible. And so, you know, when I'm out there, you know, when I go to shoot on a tournament, it's just for shits and giggles and money and, and fake clout because you shot well or did well or won. But when you're shooting an animal, it, so if I shoot at a target in Redding, for instance, and I miss, the target doesn't say a goddamn thing. It doesn't, it doesn't give me any feedback. I laugh at me and my friends laugh at me. The animal doesn't do anything. If I shoot an animal poorly, I hear it, I see it, I feel the animal's reaction to it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the shit screams out and makes me feel like a total POS. You guys know what I'm talking about. Animals yeah. make sounds. I mean, a lot, a lot of people don't want animals make sounds. Now, yeah. granted, it's great when you make a good shot and you just hear that thump, and the animal jumps and runs and bleeds out and you don't hear shit, but that's not always reality. It's just not. I mean, if, if you're hunting, you know, if you're a bear hunter, everybody knows what the, what the death groan is. Um, when the bears dying, it usually lets out a moan at the end that is not a comfortable sound. 
And so no, for deer, me, deer I'm, do some, but like I've shot deer too. And it's like, the sounds they are making, you're like, Jesus, but it gets right. there quick and put it out of its misery. Exactly. And so for me, I'm thinking about one, my number one thing, and, and this is why I prepare, like when I go hunting, my hunting bows are as tuned as dialed in as any target bow I ever have. Why? So I have this conversation with a lot of people and I say, look, if you were to give me or a Levi Morgan, I'm not signed, trying to compare myself to Levi folks, save the emails. Um, but if you were to give us, you know, if we were to walk into a room and you were to say, okay, there's a bow in a box, a rest in a box, arrows, the whole nine yards, other than cutting and fletching arrows, you have an hour to build this bow and you're going to go hunt whitetail out of a tree stand. No problem. No problem. I can become absolutely lethal, 100% lethal on a whitetail at 20 yards out of a tree stand in an hour. No question. It's no question. If you tell me, hey, here's all this shit right here, you're going to be going to hunt elk out in New Mexico uh, on the transition. So your shots could be anywhere from 50 to 90 yards. I do. I'm going to need a week at least a straight week because the amount of preparation for me and that piece of equipment, I have to have a certain level of confidence out to a certain distance. Could I shoot a hundred yards with the hours set up bow? Uh, sure. But I wouldn't because that to me would not be morally or ethically right to the animal. I want to have the confidence to know that I've done everything I can in my allotted time to make sure that I'm going to be as lethal and as ethical of a hunter as I possibly can be. And so for so, whitetail, so Greg, when you're, when you're doing like, so when talking about that, like you can shoot at hundred yards, no problem. Like we all know you can, can, like, I'm sure you could pick up any bow and shoot at hundred yards and hit two inch grouping. No problem. When you're, when you're saying you're going through, like you want to put in five to six, seven days, like a good week, Mm -hmm. Is that to break in the bow or to get you more comfortable with that bow? Like, No, that's to get the bow and the arrows tuned the way I gotcha. want them. Gotcha. So okay. um, that's to get my sight marks or my pin set properly. That's to make sure that, you know, if I, cut something, if I cut something loose at it, you know, I got to get my draw length perfect. At 20 yards, my draw length can, I'm not even shitting you. At 20 yards, my draw length can be off an inch. Yeah. Don't give a shit. I'm, I'm a 32 inch draw length, dude, you can throw me in a 31 or a 33 and it, and it goddamn 20 yards out of a tree stand, even an inch long, it's going to help because downhill makes it feel shorter. I don't care. I could kill a deer at 20 yards out of a tree stand with a draw length. That's an inch longer or shorter. Doesn't matter. Arrow flight could be, you know, and that's the whole thing in an hour, someone like Levi or myself, we're going to get the arrow flight good enough at 20. It's going to be fine. No problem. Now, 20 years ago, when we were shooting these giant Cabela's heads that none of them were straight, none of them flew the same, that's a different scenario. But nowadays, you know, if you're shooting a beast broadhead or a schwacker or, you know, a, you know, whatever it may be, a Anything sever, almost. yeah, yeah you're going to be fine. But no, so for me, it's going to be a matter of getting the bow um, dialed in to fit me, uh, making sure my peep height's right, making sure my arrows are dialed right, um, making sure that that the bow is tuned to a point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bear shaft guy. Um, I'm going to make sure that the piece of equipment that I'm going to be running with for that kind of a scenario is going to allow me to do what I need to do and not punish me for doing something that's outside my lane. And um, that's part of the thing with people buying bows and being like, Oh, going hunting in two weeks. Doop, 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 doop. Oh God. Not only, I mean, if, if any of us had not shot a bow for three months, let's say it was a contest. We said, okay, everybody, <clears throat> no bow shooting for three months. Okay. You're going to pick up your bow today. You're going to shoot 10 practice shots, and then you're going to go hunt whitetail out of a tree stand. Every single one of us would be fine. We've all shot enough. Yeah. We, could get away, we could get away with it. If we said, oh, you're going to go antelope or elk hunting, out on the freaking out in out in Alberta when you're in seven million acres of three and a half tall, three and a half foot tall 
hay or whatever. No, those extended shots, we all know that we would immediately be like, ooh, God damn, I need to prepare Not more. Happening. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, even and when so, you don't do them constantly, you find like, like it's totally perishable though. Like shooting at seven yards, like I got 70 yards in my front yard and that's what I shoot at most of the time. But then I'll once in a while, I'll shoot at 40 for like a week or so. But then when you go back to 70, you notice it right away. Like you notice like instantly you're like, wow, like, you know, it yeah. doesn't take very long for your grouping to get off in that extra 30 yards. Exactly. And now imagine being someone who's never even done it, that thinks they're going to buy a bow and try to kill an animal in a week or two. Yeah that's the fallacy of, of our particular dynamic right now. Um, and whether that's holdover from people that are rifle hunting or, you know, cause look, <clears throat> this is the thing is like, Oh, everybody can grab a rifle. No. Well, yeah, you can, if you want to shoot something at two, 300 yards, I've been to sales meetings and stuff where they had, um, rifles set up and I've been with guys and at a thousand yards, I could not hit an 18 by 18 inch plate because I did Greg pool didn't know how to properly execute the shot on this rifle. My cheek pressure was too much. And I was doing all kinds of things that would not allow me to hit that target at eight at a thousand yards, 18 by 18 inch plate. I couldn't do it. I thought I was doing the best, but I was doing a bunch of shit wrong. A guy who's a like 20 time champion uh mr koning uh koenig excuse me picked this rifle up that i was shooting and i couldn't hit with and i was in a i was on a bench by the way now i did look like a monkey fucking a football in it because it was way too small for me but <laughs> i just couldn't i just couldn't i couldn't do it he picked this doug picked this bow up or excuse me this rifle up 308 picked it up and stood there on his two feet and hit the plate three times in a row because yeah. he knew because he knew how to execute yeah so when we start talking about you know archery that's really what it comes down to and so so for me when when i'm going to harvest an animal number one is i'm taking a life and i want to do that as as quickly and as ethically as i can Shit happens. We all know that we've all done it. It does happen, but your intent absolutely has to be to do everything you can in your preparation to be as lethal and as ethical as you can. Now, am I running marathons like Cam Haynes is? Hell no, but Cam Haynes is a way better hunter than a lot of people realize. And his conditioning physically allows him to do shit. I could never dream of period. Just couldn't. And so that is, that's part of that preparation. I mean, if you watch any of cam stuff, dude, he's shooting broadheads 24 seven down the side of his truck. He shoots at 150 yards for shits and giggles and still gets people talking shit about it. But it's the level of preparation that allows someone to have the confidence to do those things. And I think the problem with our sport, whether it's, hunting over bait or trail cameras or shooting is people see other people do it and assume that they should be able to do it too, or that they can. Well, when I'm watching NASCAR and I watch some dude or chick, I guess, whatever, driving around the track at 250 miles an hour, turning left, there is no part of me that thinks I can do that. None. There's none of me that thinks, ah, oh, no problem. Let's jump in the F-350 and go drive 200 miles an hour. None of it. None of it because I understand not everything ain't for everybody. And just because I see it on the internet or on TV doesn't make me think I can do it. But in, in, in hunting and in the outdoor industry, we have kind of convoluted those realities to where we have as an industry, we have intentionally marketed Kevin, you can have the same equipment. This guy does. You can do the same thing. This guy does. You're just as good as this guy. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm sorry. I'll be the first guy to throw my hand up. No, you're not. No, you're not. And neither am I, but we have intentionally convoluted those to sell you shit mm -hmm. because yeah. we want you to think you're going to be as good as the person you saw on TV. If you have the same product. And so we've kind of did it to ourselves. Yeah. yeah. yeah it has nothing to do with that. Table. It, it has ahead. to do with work. 
I mean, you're not going to yeah. get, you have to be willing to do more than the guy next to you at anything right. in life, but at work, business, it doesn't matter what you want to do. If you want to be successful at it, you have to be willing to outwork everyone. And it it's not just right. like do it for two weeks before the season. It's do right. it 365 days a year, every day, get up at 4 a.m. and work out, train, go to work for seven, eight hours a day, come home, deal with your kids, and then train again and go to bed and do it every day, day and do it. Not too many guys can do that. Yeah. Exactly. It's just the fact well, that like not too many guys are willing to do that, but everybody wants to reap the rewards. Yes. And all the well, and at the kids these days too, they look at these movies and they watch this and be like, I can go do that. And they go try it once and they give up and be like, well, like we were laughing at our own kids just last night at the dinner table. They, they weren't here, um, but we were talking about them. And like when the Hunger Games movie came out and Katniss was shooting her bow sideways like a gangster and she had that drawstring behind her bloody nose and everything. Make one, that nose is gone if she keeps that shit up. Right, um, 100%. Two, but they, they'd walk out and be like, well, I can hit that. And they wouldn't hit a target and be pissed off and being like, well, yeah, because you've never drawn back on a bow before. I can help you. Right. And you will be hitting that target by the end of the day. You won't be hitting the bullseye, but we'll get you to hit the target and work right. from there. No, I'm done. And it's yeah. like, what the fuck? Like, this shit, this shit ain't easy. Like, right. Well, and it, it's, it's just like I said about my professional career. I was simply not as good between the years as a bunch of these goats that I had to shoot against. Period. So the thing that people nowadays don't want to understand, they don't, they don't want to comprehend this. But here's a great example. There's four of us on. I can see all of us. So no matter how hard you work, some things just aren't going to happen for you. So raise of hands, four of us. I can see all four of us. Raise your hand if you can dunk a basketball. I oh. have. Can I? No, <laughs> not right now, but I have. Can I use exactly. the ladder? So it, that's my point. So two of us, <laughs> two of us can or have dunked a basketball. Why haven't you guys? Because probably I'm a hockey because, player. Right. Probably because you're too <laughs> short and you're not Spud Webb. So no matter how hard you work at it, some things just aren't possible for some people. And that's just the reality. And some folks don't want to understand that. And when it comes to certain things, yes, there is a level of work ethic that will make you more successful than people could ever imagine. And you want to know who the poster boy is for that? And people are going to think this is just riding dicks, but that ain't my gig. Is Cam Haynes. Have you guys met Cam? No. 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 Do you know how big Cam is? Now, he's shredded out. Don't, it, Dude, I'd be walking around with my shirt off all the goddamn time, too, if I was as ripped up as he is. But do you know how big Cam is? He's probably as small as Kevin over there. Cam's about, about Cam's about this big. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm holding up my arms. Cam is not a giant man. Cam is a small dude. He doesn't weigh 225 pounds. I mean, he's probably a, you know, 175, 180. Uh, when he's running these ultra marathons, he probably drops a bunch of weight. But Cam is not a huge person. How tall is he? If he's one. That's Dude, pretty... he's got to be like five, six, five, seven. Five seven. Oh, really? five? Well, if you're five yeah. seven and you're one eighty, that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, but he's not I'm a huge six person. foot, and I'm one, like just under one ninety. So, yeah, so he's not a huge person, and so when you see him running and stuff and 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 lifting, and Cam even explains it, I'm not the most talented person, period, but I work harder than everybody, and I'm willing to do what other people aren't, so I can do what some other people can. And that kind of work ethic will get you way ahead in life <clears throat> more than, well, I bought the same shit as that guy. Why can't I do it? Well, because yeah. one, you haven't tried hard enough. You haven't put in the work and the effort to do it. And then the other part is you, you just might not be, you just might not be able to. And that's the point. And so what Cam has done is he has illustrated that you don't got to be, you know, six well, one if you're six seven 285 like me you ain't running marathons anyway but he has proven that regardless of of size regardless of ability regardless of a lot of things the entrenched work ethic that someone like him has allows you to succeed in ways that people with a lot more talent never will and 
that's just the bottom that's just the bottom line but in today's society uh, everybody gets a, part a participation trophy um, everyone gets told how great they are everybody gets vaseline rubbed on their hiney and told that it's special and different from everybody else's and we all know that the cold reality of that when you open the door and walk outside your mom's basement is the world is out there ready to punch you right in the mouth and the real yeah. world the real world doesn't give a shit about any of that that's why these these blue-haired woke folk when they get out into the real world they they can't handle it you know whether it's yeah. the whether it's the Starbucks employee who was bawling their eyes out cuz they had to work 8 hours in a day only 8 <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a partial day. Congratulations. Yeah. But they're in the back crying and having a complete fit because they think that they're a slave for having to work eight hours a day as yeah, a barista. They're, they're entitled. We get, we get yeah. a lot of that. I get a lot yeah. of that. That's uh that whole mentality is is exactly why I put my kids into judo because the mm -hmm. consequences are dire. If yes. you're put into a tournament and you don't prepare your mind, your body, you're not physically in shape, you don't know the techniques, there are no other consequences I can think of worse than that not only do you have to win but you have to win in such a way that you don't take damage and right. you know i don't think there's enough of that where kids and people in general they just don't have that in their face in any way but they're not risking anything right so they think oh i can i can just buy the gadget i'm going to be better well no there are certain things that you have to do to be successful and if you do them enough times enough days in a row the difference between you and that other person that maybe you started out with or they're just starting it becomes so huge that right. you can't even you're not even on the same wavelength wavelength as far as training and how you prepare for something and it's funny you're talking about animals the more you do it the more serious you take it because at the start you just are just yearning for that success you're not thinking about those chances and and how you execute a shot on an animal the more the more animals uh, I harvest the more it it matters like thinking about oh if I make a bad shot you know you just start to respect the process and and the animal so much that if I'm not running or I'm not lifting weights or I'm not shooting my bow I have no business being out here right no I mean it's that's exactly right but the problem is is not everybody you know has our mentality not everybody knows their role and today in 2024 our, our, our mutual governments, notwithstanding, they want people to think that every lane is their lane. And when they're told this isn't your lane, you need to move. Um, they don't know how to deal with it because they're not they're You know, they're, they never have to deal with their own shortcomings or their own failures. Whereas guys like us, it's, it's been our lives. I mean, that's what's molded us. That's what's made us into who we are today. I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate since getting into archery that I've, I've had some, 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 some pretty good successes brand wise, product wise, um, you know, building some staffs and et cetera, et cetera. But dude, do you know how many failures I had? Jeez. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, if, if, if you bat 500 in major league baseball, you're a God. Well, guess what? If you bat 500 in business, you're a God too. And so, you know, whether it's Elon Musk or any of these guys, dude, they have so many failures. If you talk to Levi Morgan or dude, there's so many failures, but those are what build the kind of character that we're talking about. So, you know, to your point, when I'm going to shoot at an animal, my, my, it's just my opinion that my number one responsibility is to make the most clean, ethical, accurate shot possible. Yes, I understand. There's two inch razor blades on the end of the broadhead. I have a lot of room for error. Totally get it. Way more room for error than I do, you know, as a matter of, of what people will designate as success. Cause I've heard a lot of people like, well, long as you recover the animal, it was a win. Mm, no, no, I don't I'm believe not, that. I'm not with that either. I'm not with that either. Um, uh, simply because that's not a piece of paper. It's a, it's a living creature. And and I'm a firm believer in uh, the, the more ethical, you know, okay, granted, if you shoot some old hog of a mule deer and elk that's been out there eating sage for 
eight, nine years, that thing's going to taste like shit. It's going to taste like sage. So it don't matter. But I believe that the, the, the type of death that the animal has affects how it tastes in my opinion. Yeah. Um, a gut shot animal that sat there and expired terribly over a 12 hour span, that meat is not going to taste as good as a perfect double lung or a heart shot where it ran over there 110 yards and looked around like what the hell's happening and then goes, Oh, I'm dizzy and falls over dead. The hormones, the chemicals. And so, so for me, you know, I mean, look, we, we've all been there. We've made bad shots and we feel like shit. We, all of us, if you make a bad, if you make a suspect shot on an animal, you want nothing more in your life at that moment than to sh be able to get another arrow in that animal that's proper so that it can expire quickly. That's what hunters do. That's what we are. And so, so for me, it just comes down to, you know, everybody has their own unit of measure and whether it's, you know, the, the bait that's planted or the bait that's dumped or trail cameras or laws that change 20 feet away from each other, or, you know, all of the convoluted stuff or fish and game, you know, this is, this is something else. Fish and game officials, you know, it's like they, J Joe Rogan did a, did, did an act where he's talking about, you know, assholes amongst us or idiots. If you get together a hundred people, what are the odds? One or two of those people are going to be complete retards. It's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent. You get together a hundred people. One or two of those people are going to be complete dipshits. Well, guess what? I don't care what business you're in. I don't care what job you're in. I mean, if you're in government, the number per hundred is way higher than two. But anyway, it doesn't matter what job you have. If you're drawing from the talent pool that is available in today's society, you're going to have some dipshits amongst you. Well, guess what? Fish and games, the exact same. Police, firemen, it, it doesn't matter. Grocery store clerks, gas station attendants, it doesn't matter. There are people out there doing jobs that are just not good at it and they do dumb shit. And that's just part of life. That doesn't, that's not a condemnation of, of everyone. I mean, that's another thing that really bothers me is in today's society. Like when I see a white male did some atrocious shit back East, I don't feel bad as being a white male. It doesn't have anything to do with me at all. Just because he looks the same color as me and he's a, has a, Okay, I could get into a bad conversation just because he's a male <laughs> like me and is white or peach actually um, doesn't make me feel any worse about myself because it has nothing to do with me. And so when I make these comments about, look, it doesn't matter what job you're in. There's idiots in every job because those people are hired from society. It's not a condemnation on the entire craft. You know, when I'm driving down the road and I see a, a Swift truck or an Amazon truck or whatever, and the driver's all over the road and is just a terrible truck driver, that doesn't make me think that all truck drivers suck. Makes me it's think, one. just makes me think that driver sucks. But in today's society, everyone just wants to rush to this judgment of painting everything with a huge brush. And that's part of the problem we have with hunting. Statistically, 10% 10, 10 and it's kind of dropping, but 10% of America, talking about America specifically, 10% of Americans hunt, 10% of Americans are hardcore anti-hunting, and 80% don't really think about it one way or another. They're not for it. They're not against it. Until, until you see a picture of a doe in a neighborhood with an arrow sticking through its head because some jackass tried to do something stupid and the animal's still alive with an arrow sticking through its whole head. Yeah. What do you think those 80% do with that? Yeah, they're now, the yeah, they're now damn hunters. Exactly. Damn yeah. hunters. Same goes for, and I know that a lot of entrenched hunters are like, well, that's just the reality of it. Not the deer and not the arrow in the head, but like when you go to do your, your recovery shot and sometimes God, guys will leave the tongue hanging out and there's blood dripping off of it and blood bubbles coming out of the nose. And yeah. it's like, dude, this is, it's not 1980 anymore. This is the internet that is going to go, could potentially go out. Just take a little bit of time and just read the room. Just think about yeah. it. I specifically 
do that. Like even my white tail this year, you know, I had blood coming out of its mouth. I actually dragged it a couple feet to the side. So you couldn't see the, you know, it wasn't a huge pool of blood coming out, but a little bit. Right. It took snow and I wiped it off just for a quick, you know, it took all of less than a minute. And, but it was and realizing exactly what you're saying. If I post this like this, uh, it's not cool. It's not respectful either, in my opinion. Yeah, well, and what it's going to do is it, is it one, it's going to give that 10% that already hates us ammunition. Yeah. Yes. And it's going to potentially turn that 80% to go, that's stupid. Yeah, that's gross. It, d distasteful. Great word. That's a great way to put it. Distasteful. And it doesn't take very long, you know, just because, well, I can do what I want. Yeah, yeah, you can. You can do what you want. But your I can do what I want mentality about it is, it's not even could, is, not in every single instance, but is across the board and has caused damage to our entire cause. Yeah. Not because yeah, 100, it's illegal. 100%. Yeah, Absolutely. it's not illegal. It, there's nothing it's not it's not wrong per se it's just not thoughtful and it's not and it's not being mindful of people who nowadays are going to see that imagery that it could make them have feelings about it that are negative to us you know take you know like when you look at the basically it's voting yeah. <clears throat> when, well and you're not pushing the prop like the the like yeah that's i mean it's all part of hunting for sure it is but there's so much more to it than that like there's it's just way more to it than that like when you're not it sucks now like i know like my dad and them they did they never had to worry about that stuff but then there wasn't the internet around right they just did whatever right. but it's not 1980 it's 2024 and it's a lot different time and you have to think like hey who's gonna see this and what are they gonna be saying about it it sucks that we have to do that but that's the reality of it we have to i mean unfortunately right. hunting is in the hands of the non-hunters if they go to a vote and they decide that there's no more hunting, the 80% rules out the 10%. It's just the way it is. The sad yep. part about that whole thing is that one picture that is distasteful potentially just took away an entire, potentially an amazing story. The hard work that you put into it, the hours that you went into it, you know, all the, all the right things that you did in a positive way that whole season to get that animal. And that one picture, now they don't care about it. They don't care about right. the story behind it. It's just like, did you see what that guy posted? Yeah, it's yeah. in the wrong message too, right? As a conservationist, as someone who's, you know, you can't say, oh, we care about the animals and then show a picture that looks really brutal, right? And is distasteful. You know, that's that's not uh, that's not sending the right message, right? Because the average person that doesn't know that work, they don't, they've never went, hunting they don't know anything about it and then they see that they can't you can't have the stance of we care about the animals so much more than everyone else and then you know their tongue is hanging out and their guts are hanging out or they're posting a kill shot where their entrails are hanging out because it's a poor shot like that's not that will not make sense to someone who doesn't hunt exactly well and i mean so for me the i you know and i think i'm a <clears throat> i'm a fairly rational person and and you know, I, I at least have the capacity and the experience to allow my feeling, my initial feeling to give me an indication of what somebody else would think. And I think you guys are probably the same. So I don't care who it is. Doesn't matter to me what hunter it is. Instagram hunter, Insta ho, Insta bro, don't give a shit about none of that. If Greg Poole sees a picture of any animal like you just described, yeah. And guts are hanging out and there's giant blood bubbles out of its face or even worse is when you is when they take the picture and you still have the arrow sticking out of it and it's terrible it's like a terrible shot if it makes me go Ugh, that's that doesn't even uh, yeah uh, i don't care for that visual if I have that initial reaction, imagine what some anti or some person on the fence is going to say. Yeah. And you're right. It does suck that we have to do that nowadays, but dude, it sucks. We have to do a lot of things nowadays. Like, yep. Oh, I don't know, have an opinion. Uh, you know, want free speech. I mean, there's a whole bunch of shit that we're fighting to keep now. Hunting is hunting is, is easy. 
it's, it's an easy one. And the reason it's easy, you know, and this is something that a lot of people don't really think about, <clears throat> you know, all these you know, talking about TV hunters or in Insta fluencers. Now I separate the Insta fluencers that are putting out um, what I call comprehensive content. And let me explain there. So, and it's, uh, let's see, who's a good, uh, Chris B nice kid. Um, he is putting out comprehensive content which means he's putting out content across the board about all kinds of things, the traveling, the tuning, the practicing, the shooting, the, the harvest, the yeah. putting out content about all of it. Now transfer that over to someone who has a television show. They now have 13 to 26 episodes where they have to provide 20, depending on how many commercials they're selling, they have to provide 22 to 23 minute episodes and they have to pack all of that story into one 23 minute episode. So it's not comprehensive content. It is telling a short story, hopefully with a conclusion with a harvest. That's a huge difference than a guy like Chris B who gets to have, cause he's on YouTube. He can have five episodes that are 25 minutes long telling yeah. the story of working up to and all this kind of yeah. other stuff. And so that's why you're seeing such a big transition right now from hunting television, which next year's it's going to be getting a facelift and it's not going to be a good one. Um, but that's why you see people that like a Chris B um, that are putting out that kind of stuff. And there's lots of other ones. I just, I know Chris, he's a good kid, nice guy. So, I mean, there's lots of them hunting public. There's bunches of them. Yeah, those guys are awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, I just picked out Chris cause I know him and it was quick in my head, but then you have other people that are just doing the television show thing, whether it's a Levi or a, a Lee Likoski, well on network, well, you have a whole different level of deliverables because that network and most of the time your sponsors, they don't give a shit other than 23 minutes, some of the story, some B roll, some education and a kill but it all has to be compact into this tiny little, tiny little thing. And how many television shows do you think are sustainable and do very well when they don't kill no animals? Yeah. Yeah, they don't. And so I'm not making excuses for some of the wild shit. Some TV show guys have done, but the amount of, and I'm not dismissing it whatsoever, but the amount of pressure that they're under to harvest animals so that they can have a conclusion to their particular episode is immense. It's, it's absolutely immense. And people don't necessarily want to understand that. They just think it's all freaking love, peace and chicken grease. And they're just freaking pr printing money and they get all the archery hose they can handle. And, you know, they show up to a place and the guide goes, well, yeah, your deer will be coming out over there at three 14 PM. So head on out there about two and get your snacks and get all your stuff going and you, you'll be good to go. Not saying that doesn't happen, but that is not the norm. I'm sorry. That is not the way it works. And so the amount of pressure these guys are under is incredible. So the kind of content you see on TV hasn't really changed a lot ever. I mean, you have to get all of these cutaway B-roll shots of, of your bow and your broadhead and your arrows and your rest and your sight and your release and your camo. And you, so you have all these deliverables you have to pack into 23 minutes that are outside of the story itself because that's the business whereas a chris b on youtube he has all the time he wants it, it doesn't matter it doesn't yeah. and you could to... yeah like you said you could continue it on through other episodes and like we have friends who are getting into that space and yeah you know they transition from youtube to television and uh, yeah you know the tough game's well, not easy that uh that ship's about to take a big turn next year yeah yeah so, i always feel anyway that like you're you're gonna get more out of like um the internet like youtube than you will i don't even know like who even why like obviously there is people but i mean i i don't really watch youtube or tv too much so i, I can't really speak on it but i mean i don't like there's a lot of people you won't tune into like sportsman channel and all that anymore compared no, to like, it's, youtube it's fallen off a whole bunch a whole whole bunch um now granted your lee lakoski's your jim shockies they're still going to pull decent numbers they're not going to 
they're not going to pull even close to the kind of numbers they do on their YouTube channel or, or their social media accounts that they do um, on network. Number one, the network has started to cut down so hard on what you see um, on network that, you know, a lot of them are not allowing impacts. Like you got to cut away before the impact. They don't, oh, yeah. you know, no blood, no, no tongues hanging out. I mean, they have a lot of restrictions. YouTube is starting to kind of get there to where they're like, look, we don't want to, you know, to your point, we don't want to see the entrails dragging out the bottom, try to keep it classy just because it's real. Doesn't mean that it, we need to show it type stuff. So yeah. Yeah. it's getting there a little bit, but um, <clears throat> the amount of pressure that these TV show guys are under is immense because they have deliverables that they have to do. And like I said, I'm just going to preface it again. I'm not dismissing shithead behavior by television show people historically because they've all not every show, but it's always been that way. Whether it was back in the nineties when the guys were killing big bucks and freezing them and then going and putting them underneath the tree and doing a reenactment. I mean, there's been some wild shit that they've done because they have to deliver and it was attached to a monetary thing. So um, you know, that part itself is something that a lot of people don't consider. It's not an excuse, but the transition we're seeing now is from a consumer standpoint, the four of us, <clears throat> I ain't watching no goddamn infomercials at all. I'm sorry. If I'm watching a piece of your social media or, uh, you know, I don't even have any hunting channels on TV anymore. I just don't, yeah, but do yeah, if, if, if I'm watching a hunting thing, and it's more B-roll and cutaways for product placement than it is storytelling, educational, or harvesting. Dude, I'm out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, don't I actually like care. watching some of the ones that uh, where they don't get anything. And it's like, yeah, now we're talking. That's more realistic. That's right. that's that's 90% of most people's hunts is not right. coming well, away with something until they do. Right. So to, to that point, let's talk about that real quick. How excited would we be? And I don't watch football either, but how excited would you be to watch the Super Bowl if it was zero to zero? How excited would how excited would you be to watch a NASCAR race that never finished? <laughs> yeah. It's so tough. the part of the hunting television, and and I agree with you. Hunting is not always hunting is not killing. The problem is once you put something on TV, it is like the NFL is registered as an entertainment business, mm -hmm. not a sports business. So once you have a t hunting television show, you're not hunting anymore. You're in entertainment. And I feel like that's going to be the real hard part as we move forward with just with like society and like their ex less and less acceptance of like those kill shots on TV and like even like platforms right. like YouTube and television where they just won't allow it as much as they did before. How right. do you really tell the story of hunting? Well, exactly. That was and a kill shot. Well, not is... everybody wants to watch that. It's not going to get the clicks that it does when you have like Josh Bomar shooting a 220 inch whitetail that he's been following for two years. Do you know what I mean? Like he tells the story and that, but then it has the kill shot. So then like, if he just had the story of this deer that he was following for two years and never killed it, you'd be like, well, what the fuck? Right. Well, and so here's, you know, and look, Love him, hate him or not, Josh is probably one of the best hunters I've ever met in my life. Yeah, he, my kid, like my kid loves him. I I never even watched any of his stuff. Well, my kid loves he loves he's always on it's always on he's always watching that. And it's like, and then you start watching it as well, and you're like, well, fuck, man. Like, yeah, he he's freaking he that guy works fucking hard. Oh, but then it, it goes back to like, you're not gonna get any results at anything you do in life if you're not willing to put in the work. It's just the reality of it. Right. No well, what I you're mean, doing, you fucking laying brick. You're not going to get the work of it doing and, anything in life. And Josh and Sarah don't, don't even accept sponsorships. None. None sponsorships. None. Mm -hmm. And pressure off. Well, it, it well, and well, so I mean, I'm, at that point, what what difference does it make if you're getting like you just use the shit you like to use? And I think that's right. better anyway. That's that's a lot more respectable too. Like when you're watching a channel and and like you're saying, go back to the product placement stuff. That I don't want to. I don't want to tune into that. Right. I want to learn. I want to learn something. 
I want to see someone else's kind of mentality behind how they're approaching stuff. And, and, you know, those guys that, you know, they are sponsored, you know, that there is some vested interest to kind of massage things to work, right. To make sure that the perception is, is that's, that's, Oh, this is the way to go. Well, you know, versus the person that this is what I use. This is why I'm using it. Right. That, that to me is a lot more honest and genuine. Right. And that's why people are tuning in because it's genuine. Yeah. Well, and the, the problem with that is this item, this, uh, excuse me, this category <laughs> is really what it is. This category is the greatest thing in this category I've ever used. And then two years later, someone else pays them more and they're like, well, yeah. this yeah. category is the best cat in the category that I've ever used because now I'm getting $10,000 more to s- s- say that. that. So yeah. like if, if, if you look at the, dude, the Bomar bow hunting, uh, YouTube is almost at 2 million. It was at 350,000 last year, and it's almost at 2 million on YouTube. Now their channel is going to be the biggest hunting only channel period in the space. So they, you know, cause obviously Josh and Sarah own like, goddamn, I don't know, eight or 10 businesses. It's fucking crazy. But Bomar nutrition is a massive supplement company. So oh, they yeah, don't need those. Yeah. 2 million subscribers. Yeah. yeah. They don't need sponsorships they're not beholden here's the point and i know everyone's gonna be like oh fuck josh bomar the government tried to tell josh bomar why, to shut so why why like is he like we're up in canada and like i don't i'm not yeah. really a, i don't watch a lot of tv or like all that stuff so why does why does he so, fuck well, josh like, bomar? i don't like know. 10 years ago josh and sarah were hunting at a guide service down in oklahoma and the guide was doing tons of terrible shit like all kinds of terrible shit. Well, like 38 people got busted and everybody just pled out. But Josh and Sarah Bomar were like, we didn't do anything wrong. So they fought it. So whether you're a sponsor or the government, you're not going to boss them around and try to bully them into submission. So they refused to just agree to something that they didn't, that they didn't do. And, you know, that's part of this whole baiting thing. They said, oh, they were baiting because they have uh, Josh and this uh, guide on video pouring out corn. It's not illegal to bait there. It's only illegal to hunt within 200 yards of it. And hundreds of hours of B-roll, geo-tracking on phones, all of nothing placed them within 200 yards of the bait when they were hunting. So... It's just all it's just a bunch of shit. I get it. It's just a bunch of shit. But the government tried to harass the Bomars and the Bomars were like, nah, dog, sorry. We, we're you're barking up the wrong tree. And they fought them the entire way. Actually sued oh, the federal, okay. sued the federal government back. So okay. I thought it was because I remember there was something he speared a bear in a, uh Alberta and then they Alberta, changed the rights. Right. That but was that, that that was nothing like that wasn't illegal. But, no, no, yeah. that's the whole th- well, and that's the whole thing about the the whole Under Armour thing was one sparing the sparing the bear wasn't illegal. Under Armour because they ended up caving to PETA, it was on an Under Armour lease. Oh, Under Armour knew about it the whole time, but when PETA got involved, they're like, "Oh, he speared a bear." Well, there was nothing illegal about it. He didn't. Well, what do fuck it. difference does it make? Like a spear is just a longer version of an arrow. Exactly, and yeah, fuck it. Like, hey man, you go try to spear like the like the natives used to do back in the day Fuck like that i'm good they're spearing um, uh brown bears on the coast north coast of british columbia like nope hey I'm good. Ever. i'm you I'm go good. for that do it no. yeah no Josh, some, con- some context Josh. to that a little bit too like he was a javelin thrower correct uh, like division like, division one college like yeah. yes yes well, and I, like like i read the article because i'm in alberta but to the context of the government that was in power too, it was an NDP government. If it was a conservative government, I don't even think that they would have done anything. Right. But well, it was just the outrage of it. Well, yeah. you know, maybe the reaction was excited, but he just speared a, a, a bear. Like, yeah, I mean, fucking spear a bear. They just do it. Like, so now that now you can't spear <laughs> bears after that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That in makes, Alberta. Yeah. That makes like, no who sense. Who the fuck? Like, yeah. Like, if you want to go, like, that's to me, it's. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm thinking a, about that. Like, again, no, I'm good. It comes back you to, have the, to get the narrative enough. they were they were trying to push a narrative though before that of like the park thing. Like I was just talking about earlier, they were pushing the parks. They're pushing a lot of that that was going to kind of lock out, and then this occurred. 
you know, it's just ammunition, right? They're just right. trying to push their narrative, you know, hunt are bad, bears yeah. are good, you know, like how could anybody hunt a bear kind of deal? And uh and and that's why too, like we've been talking about this whole time, context of how non-hunters are gonna see this. Yeah. Right. So they, well, took, and- they took a bunch of little clips of him yeah. and then that's what gets shown, right? Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and so you know, so they finally like it was literally nine, ten years ago. So they finally settled the 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 thing. I think it was Oklahoma or Nebraska. Anyway, one of them. And so everyone wants to crucify Josh, thinking that he you know did a whole bunch of bad shit. And that's the whole point. Thirty five or thirty six other people pled to lesser charges because who knows why Josh and Sarah. They killed a hundred and ten inch deer, whitetail. Hundred and ten inch deer, whitetail. You tell me that Josh and Sarah Bomar are gonna try to cheat to kill a one ten. They don't even kill one fifties because they're too small. Yeah. But yet they're gonna. It's just it was just completely stupid. But that's you know that's kind of part of the hunting thing is. And look, people don't like Josh and Sarah because one, Josh was also a professional bodybuilder. Yeah, a he's natural fucking jack, that guy. He's jacked as shit. Sarah is fine as frog jacked hair. Too. She's yeah, drawing too. 70 pounds. 70. She. She's a oh, a real she, by the way. She's drawing 70 pounds. 70 pounds. A woman. I've watched it with my own eyeballs. And so they are incredibly successful. And yeah, they're easy targets. Josh is, hey, look, Josh is a meathead. He's a jock but he's smart as shit and he has more energy and more drive than most people I've ever met in my life. And you know, like his, his truck caught on fire this last year while he was trying to burn because he manages all of his properties himself. And so he did something he probably shouldn't have and caught his own F F three fifty on fire. And everyone's like, Oh, he did that for clout. He doesn't have to do that for clout. Oh, he did that for insurance money. They have two, quarter million dollar phantom cameras the fuck are you talking about so people just want to hate to hate yeah but they do josh but has they do like- that in everything though man like anything fucking exactly. people just that's just human nature if somebody sees you with something that they want to have but they're not willing to do the work to get it they right. just dog on you that's the way life is yeah and i mean but people and the bomars they don't bro- they don't broadcast it but the amount of charitable work that they do is off the fucking charts they donate more money for shit than I make a year. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. no one wants to talk about that stuff. Anyway, I've known Josh and Sarah for way longer than any of this, you know, not nine, 10 years, of course, but I've known Josh and Sarah for a long time. I consider them friends. I've been, you know, I knew about these stories. I've, I've asked them straight up because I ain't bullshit and I ain't fluffing nobody's chub. I mean, if you've ever met me or talked to me, fluffing people's chubs, this isn't my gig. And no, so I you're six, seven, you don't have to do shit. <laughs> right. And so, <laughs> I mean, I've asked them straight up and so, but they are good people. They do a ton of charitable stuff and to their content, if you go to their, their YouTube page, they took one of those quarter million dollar phantom cameras to Africa with them. They have a clip. I don't know how long it is. Not very long. It's got over 50 million views of shooting some African horned animal. I don't know what it was, whatever at 4,000 frames per second. I think I've seen that. That's the one when you can like actually see the arrow. It looks like you're just pushing it. And yes, it and you can just like, see yeah. it rotating. That's so whole, cool. Have you bro. seen that, Pete? No, I haven't. Well, it's I've seen different seen clips it? of yeah. that slow. Yeah, it's just it. like going in and it's yeah. just like so slow motion. You can actually, and you'll see it like split the hairs and the hairs move. <laughs> yes. And then yeah. the arrow just like slowly. Oh, is that the one like, that, that you animal remember that like movie? a gazelle or whatever? It's what was yeah. that movie with that and he's pushing man. that knife in on that guy and it's like so slow and he's fighting and it's just like <laughs> that's what it reminded yeah. me of yeah, just yeah. like super I know slow one. but but what they're doing you know speaking of the bomars what they're doing with their editing right now is going to change the game period um if you go look at those videos <clears throat> and you look at some of their other videos i'm not going to mention any names but and people won't know who they are but there is actually producers of other television shows and other media companies commenting on their content, 
how the hell are we supposed to compete with this? That's awesome. So Good for they are, you know, and, and look, them. yeah, I'm the kind of guy that once I'm your friend and once you're my friend, unless you get caught doing some, some chomo shit, um, I got you and I'm not going to cut some, I'm not going to cut off a friend just because other people tell me to and stuff. But, um, if, if Josh and Sarah Bomar were as big a douchebags as some people out there think they are, I wouldn't be friends with them. Yeah. I, 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 when I see people that are successful, I just think, man, those guys must've worked really hard. Oh, dude. where they are. That's my first thought. Like if you follow my first Josh, natural thought is like, man, they must've worked really hard to get where they are. Cause I know how hard I work to get where I am. Yeah. And like, it's just, you, you get there with hard work. There's no other, like it's, it is what it is. And he has a ton of properties. He manages them himself. Guess why? Yeah. Cause he doesn't trust anybody else because his grandfather is the one that taught him how to hunt. He's been killing giant deer with a homemade bow since he was a teenager. It's fucking ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's he ridiculous. He probably loves it too. He probably has yeah. a lot of passion for it. Oh dude. It's, it's unbelievable. He's up at 4.00 AM going to work out and then he goes and works on the, it's, it's ridiculous. But the proof is in the pudding and the fact that their page has went from like three, the in, uh, not Instagram, a uh, YouTube has went from like 350,000 to 2 million in the span of a year and a half. And they don't buy any followers is absolutely unreal. Their amount of charitable work and stuff. And just over, overall, they're, they're good people. They're, mm -hmm. they are good people. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there that want to hate on them. I don't really give a shit. Um, but you shouldn't hate on someone you don't really know. And the court of a public opinion isn't where you get to know somebody. So, so, you know, back, back to, you know, that, that particular point is, you know, as this content and, and go watch some of the Bomar bow hunting YouTube. And you're going to be like, this is literally the future of hunting content. Um, the shit that he's doing um, just with the way they edit stuff together. And that's been part of what it has been the demise of hunting television is they've most of them never really adapted. They never changed it up when they saw the change coming. They, this is the way, this is the way we've always done it. Well, guess what? Next year, those channels are probably going to be more old Westerns than they are hunting because there's some big, big names in archery hunting that are leaving hunting television next year. So that's all I'll say about that, but on air anyway. Um, and so you know, you have certain people that are reading the room. Um, you know, the Lakoskis have always been on the forefront of it. Jim Shockey's kind of always been on the forefront of it. His son, uh, Jim Shockey's son, um, uh, yeah. Braylon, dude, that guy is so talented. It's ridiculous. He's actually the one that started helping cam when cam retired. And when I say retired, a lot of people out there don't realize that cam worked for the city of Eugene or the state or whatever, his entire career up until last year. Everything he did, he did while working a nine to five job. A lot of people don't understand that. And so he did finally retire. Um, but as we're, I mean, we're living in a very interesting time. I mean, we, we could take that political as, as far as we wanted, but in the hunting industry, this is a, this is the precipice of a massive shift in what we see, how we see it and how, the, the companies interact with, um, what, uh, what I will consider internet hunting. It's not that people are hunting on the internet, but you, you understand what I'm saying is yeah. this content is getting disseminated over a lot of other mediums. There's been other ones that have tried YouTube is it right now, YouTube and Instagram. Those are pretty much what most folks are going to start moving over to. I know that there's been other ones that have tried, but YouTube Instagram, Instagram's hammering down on everything they they've taken down our other page and everything. As soon as we kind of got over 10,000 followers, it just went poof. You guys are, um, what is it? Copywriting. And it was literally no, we were that. promoting, we were promoting, uh, unethical behavior. So they shut the account down. So was that a straight Instagram thing or was that a Instagram via Canada thing? Because you, I don't know if you saw, um it's only like certain counts like i don't know something just in the algorithm i think gets flagged and like there was a it was the it started with some cover art of uh 
we had Matt Ward on and he was in, he had his Northern goat and he was had it in his backpack and it was kind of, there was some blood on white and it really uh-huh. like it stood out, but it wasn't really a, like, it wasn't offensive at all. It just had a goat in a backpack. And like, we were talking, the show was just talking about, you know, he's, he's, he's uh like just fitness and stuff for like these high Alpine hunts in British Columbia. And like, so that just, basically explained it was the cover and we posted that and then that kind of just triggered it and then they, gotcha. t- they shut the account down and then we got it back for a little bit but then they deleted it permanently well, well if derek's post the other couple of weeks ago or whatever just shooting targets and the whole discipline yeah. behind it got taken down because he's on a bench shooting a gun at a target range jeez like, well elon musk just did a quick interview with someone the other day and they were talking about free speech and elon said foundationally X Twitter is the ultimate free speech platform on the internet. And then he says, however, we also have to comply with certain regions Mm -hmm. guidelines. And I think what he was referring to, I don't know if it was Germany or no, I think it was the UK. The UK was threatening to ban Twitter in the UK. If, Twitter X doesn't enforce the anti free speech rules of the UK. And so that's why I was asking you if, if you think oh, yeah. any of your guys' stuff. Yeah. It was a Trudeau thing. Yeah. Correct. It's tough to say. Cause literally all we were doing like nothing, but there was, yeah, life story I've had it even stuff. on my personal account and like, I'm just like nothing like me hunting with like me carrying a backpack with a bow in it up a hill. And like it got flagged. Yeah, it's just weird stuff. You have to take it down. It's like I don't know. But. Well, I mean, I'm I'm continually sh- shadow banned, so I'm I'm not uh, I'm not one to preach. My my I had a fifteen thousand follower Instagram account several years ago that got deleted as well. So yeah, uh, that's yeah, and it sucks, I can't but... I can't build. I tried to do it for a while, like the page I have now. So the first one was for Big GP. This one's uh, Big Greg Pool. I can't even, I mean, I'm stuck at like 3,100, 3,200. I can't yeah. build it no matter what I do, no matter like sometimes, like for the most part, normally my stories will get like 1,500 to 2,000 views for my stories. Well, right now doesn't get over 300, no matter what it is. So I'm yeah. shadow banned. And so a lot of times you can't search me. A lot of times you can't tag me a lot of times. Um, I just can't generate more followers. And so I just kind of, kind of gave up on it anyway. So you're going to have uh, to come to the focus hunting show to find you. Right. That's it, man. That's it. <laughs> but no, it's uh, it's a very interesting time right now. Um, You know, it, it's great everywhere, see- man. Like politics, both sides, North and South of the border, man, we got mm-hmm. uh election down there coming and then there's not far behind this. It's going to be, cra- well, it's going to be crazy. I mean, those, those down there, I, I follow it once in a while like I, I turn on the news to down there just because i just it's, a lot of it is i'm just curious what donald trump's up to next and like what they're what they're after him next for so it's right. pretty well they're, right now that that da in new york's threatening to seize his assets if he doesn't pay that 350 million dollar uh unconstitutional <laughs> fine before he appeals they're trying to make him pay that oh. before he can appeal which is like and so there's business investors and stuff fleeing New York like the boss right now because literally that judge, no jury, that judge convicted him and charged him $350 million for doing what every single real estate investor in the world does. Yeah. If you appeal yeah, something, that's... doesn't it get put on hold? It's not how that works. I thought this whole point of it appeal. It does unless the judge says no. Oh. Hmm. I guess yeah, I this is a complete witch hunt. But, you know, that's part of the thing is it's like, they're claiming that his assets are so overvalued, but his own banks came in and testified for him saying, no, this is exactly how it works. Donald Trump says it's worth 300 million. The bank says it's worth 250 million. They negotiate. And then the bank gives him a loan based on the agreed upon value after it's negotiated. And he's never defaulted on those. All those loans have been paid back in full. And yet they convicted him on something that's never, ever been used in the history of the state so the way like 
Never from the used. outside looking in, it looks to me like they just don't want him to run for president again. So they're just oh, doing 100%. all this stuff. They just don't want him to Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And he is he is dick stomping everybody everywhere he goes. He just absolutely destroyed Nikki Haley in her own state. But she's a neocon anyway. She's she's a she's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, oh. and she was never going to win anyway. But no, he's absolutely crushing everyone. And yeah, they're going to keep trying. Um, yeah. They're they're going to keep trying to do everything they can so he cannot run for president, which is super democratic. That's exactly the way a democracy works. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. We'll just see what's happening. I just, uh, I mean, I just can't believe that. Um, I can't believe where we've gotten. I can't believe where you guys have gotten. I mean, you see vi- okay. videos, you know, you see videos of old blackface up there, you know, gi- giving interviews, talking about how, oh, we're not we're not going to take your guns. And then literally three, four years later, he's like, no more guns. It's like, and then y'all reelected him. Like, no. Yeah. Easy there. <laughs> right. <He's> exactly. <laughs> no. Look at work. Yeah. Don't, no, as, don't open that up with us. <laughs> exactly. well, it's a like, sore spot. <laughs> well, yeah. It's like, you know, it's like when my friends from Europe, it's like, well, you guys elected Joe Biden. And I'm like, eh, well, let's not ruin a good thing. So, yeah. No doubt. But, but I think um, uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. All right. We didn't really get into archery. I, I'm looking on my Instagram, put that thing out there, and I got I don't know, 50, 30 questions about archery here, but we're obviously not gonna get oh, into that today. So we can uh we'll, we'll we can get into it now and you, yeah. We can we can get into it now and you can just use the first part of the footage. Well, I got a I got a long run here today to do. So I'll um, copy that. All yeah, right. Well, if you guys wanna my two hours, so you guys well, we got to get into some uh, yeah. some arrow tuning stuff too. I've been waiting for this for a while, but uh, yeah, I got to I got to take off. Too. Yeah, well, let's chat, Greg. Maybe we can get you on next weekend and the weekend after, and we'll we'll hit up yeah. just arrow stuff. We'll Sounds good, buddy. Up. Politics, we'll do it. Ethics out of it. All right, thanks for ha- having me on, guys. Oh, Appreciate absolutely. it. Okay, it's guys, awesome. we'll talk to you later. Okay, talk to you later. Bye.